بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا We ask you Allah to teach us that which is beneficial for us and to benefit us from that which we learn Ameen wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam So we're back with our course uh, through the chapter of Salah, the book of Salah uh, with the great Imam Ibn Qudam al-Maqtasi rahmatullah alayhi our author, we stopped with him where he said, Bab Shara'itu Salah, the chapter pertaining to the conditions of the prayer. In this chapter, the, or in this section, the author is going to speak about matters which are imperative for us to observe before we go into the prayer and whilst we are praying. So these matters are very important for us to know about because if we don't have these correct, it can invalidate our prayer. So the author, he says, Bab Shara'it Salah, the chapter pertaining to the conditions of the prayer. Shara'it in Arabic means conditions, and it's um, mufrad, it's singular, is shart, which means condition. Linguistically, it comes from the meaning of, linguistically, it comes from the meaning as a sign. So for example, you have in the Quran, Surah Al-Muhammad, فَهَلْ يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَّا سَاعَةً أَنْ تَأْتِيَهُمْ بَغْتَةً فَقَدْ جَاءَ أَشْرَاطُهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah, are they, the disbelievers, waiting for the hour to be established and it comes upon them all of a sudden? Verily and certainly, the signs of the hour have come to them. The ashrat, okay, another plural of shart, conditions. So the linguistic meaning of condition is, as we mentioned, it is signs. The technical meaning, however, the shari meaning, the meaning of the sharia is different. It's as follows. The ulama they say, ما يلزم من عدمه العدم ولا يلزم من وجوده الوجود ولا عدم Let me break this down for you. ما يلزم من عدمه العدم That which necessitates the absence of this condition that the act of worship will be absent in terms of its validity. ولا يلزم من وجوده الوجود However, it doesn't necessitate that with the presence of this condition that the act of worship is going to be present wala adam nor does it necessitate that it's going to be absent so again this can the technical different definition of conditions is ma yalzimu min adamihi al adam that which necessitates the absence of the condition means that the act of worship will also be absent it won't be valid it cannot take place wala yalzimu min wujudihi al wujud However, it doesn't necessitate that if the condition is present, that the act of worship is going to be present, nor does it necessitate that it's going to be absent. For example, they give for this an example of wudu, for the salah. So they say, for example, that we know that you cannot pray without having wudu. You need to have wudu in order for the prayer to be valid. However, once you've made wudu, it doesn't then necessitate that you're going to go ahead and pray, nor does it necessitate that you're not going to pray. So this is an example which fits upon the condition, which fits upon the definition, the technical definition that I've just given you. So in simplicity, that without the condition, the act of worship is not going to be valid, it's not going to be present. And at the same time, if you do do this condition, it doesn't necessitate that you're going to go ahead and do the act of wor worship as we gave an example of wudu for the salah. And also the ulama, they say, الشروط أمور تجب للصلاة قبل الشروع فيها ولا بد من استمرارها From one of the definitions, one of the characteristics of the shurut, of the conditions, is that these have to be present before the salah itself. It has to be present, they have to be present before the salah has been embarked upon, and they must continue throughout the action of the prayer. Okay, so for example, if you have uh, wudu, again going back to wudu, it has to be there before the prayer starts and it has to remain with you until the prayer finishes. So if it was to break uh, before the prayer had finished, that would necessitate that then your prayer becomes invalid. So the author, he says, sittatun. These conditions are six. Ahaduha, one of them is a taharatu min al hadith. One of them is purification from hadith. And hadith, this word, uh, you would have studied it in the chapter of purification if you've studied that chapter before with somebody. Uh, just a quick recap, hadith, 
العلماء they say وصف المعنوي تقوم بالبدن يمنع من الصلاة ونهوها that a hadith is an intangible description that is found in the person in his body or her body intangible prevents the person from praying and other acts of, acts of worship similar to that so this hadith it's not physical it's intangible and it's of two types hadith is that which is minor the minor hadith is that which requires you to make wudu for so for example passing wind uh, going to the bathroom uh, ejac uh, not ejaculating um, kissing with desire um, these things and they like eating camel meat they are the things which break your wudu and put you into the state of minor hadith therefore you would need to make wudu for these matters and then you have the major hadith the major intangible impurity which is like for example uh, if you ejaculate when having um, physical intercourse marital intercourse or the woman when she experiences her menstruation this is a major state of hadith which requires one to make a ghusl for the bath she, she or he has to take the ritual bath so the author he says Ahaduha, one of these conditions one of these six conditions is a taharatu min al hadith is purification from the hadith whether it's the minor or the major liqawli rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wasallam due to the statement of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the hadith of abi dawood that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said la yaqbalu salata ahadikum idha ahdatha la yaqbalu allah salata man ahdatha hatta yatawadda that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't accept the prayer of the one who has fallen into the state of hadith until he goes and makes wudu okay and this these matters the author says وَقَدْ مَضَى ذِكْرُهَا and these matters pertaining to hadith and purification etc have been mentioned previously in the book of Tahara so the author he goes on and he says الثاني الوقت the second condition is the timing the prayer has to be done in the correct time because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nisa إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَتْ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوتًا Verily and certainly, the prayers are upon, are legislated at established times for the believers. The prayers are legislated at established times for the believers. وَوَقْتُ الظُّهْرِ مِنْ زَوَالِ shams. The author now is going to go into details, telling us what these times are. He says that the time for dhuhr, the Salat al dhuhr, is from the Zawal al shams. It's from the time when the shams, uh, when the sun has made Zawal has passed the meridian, has passed the middle of the sky. Uh, before I explain that, a quick question to yourselves, thinking about the five daily prayers. Why is the author starting with the Dhuhr prayer and not the Fajr prayer? Does anybody have any ideas? Anybody willing to answer that? Why is the author starting with Dhuhr prayer and not the Fajr prayer? The reason being is because the Dhuhr prayer is the one that Jibreel السلام, the angel Gabriel when he came to the Prophet وسلم, to teach him the timings of the prayers Dhuhr is the one that they first prayed together so that's why the ulama, the scholars they start with this time first so our author may Allah have mercy upon him he said the time for Dhuhr is from the Zawal of the Shams from the time when the sun is, has passed the midpoint of the sky so generally people who don't have access to clocks and alhamdulillah with the grace of Allah well, technology is widespread we have access to the phones the clocks we can find out the timings of the salah very easily via the internet via our clocks but if you're ever in a situation like some people are they don't have access to the internet they don't have access to clocks etc watches then they need to know how to find out the timing of the prayer so what you would do, you would take a stick or an object and you would put it into the ground and you'll find that when the sun is rising from the east in the morning, the shadow of the object is going to be leaning towards the west and it's going to be quite long. The more the sun rises towards the middle of the sky and towards the direction of the, of the west, you'll find that the shadow gets shorter and shorter. It will come to a point where the shadow actually stops it doesn't grow it doesn't shrink anymore at that point when the shadow stops it means that the sun if one was to look up would be in the midpoint of the sky now this remains for about five minutes or so this is 
known as Zawal al-Shams. When the sun then starts to move again towards the west, it starts to move again towards the west, you will see that the shadow will start to increase towards the east. Okay? But the point is that the Zawal al-Shams, the meridian time, the Zawal al-Shams that the author mentioned, it's the point when the sun reaches the midpoint in the sky, when the shadow of the object stops growing for about five minutes. It doesn't, it doesn't decrease, it doesn't change for about five minutes. And the way you would know it by the clocks, the Zawal al-Shams, is that you would look from the time of sunrise to the time of sunset and you would cut it in half. So whatever is between sunrise and sunset, you divide that by half and that is the time of Zawal al-Shams. Okay, and this is mentioned by Sheikh Taymin in his explanation of Zad al-Mustaqni Sharh al mumtah So Zawal al-Shams is the point when the sun, it stops in the middle of the sky and then it moves, it starts to move again towards the west. So this is when the time of Dhuhr starts, once the sun has moved from the midpoint in the sky where it stopped for about three to five minutes and is now moving again towards the west. This is the time when Dhuhr starts. The author, he says, إِلَىٰ أَنْ يَسِيرَ ذِلُّ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ مِثْلَهُمْ this time of Dhuhr is now going to continue until the shadow of its object, until the shadow of the object becomes the same size as the object. Okay, so this is the time when Asr will start. So Dhuhr continues all the way through until the shadow of the object becomes the same length as the object. And if you were to be intricate here, you would have to add that it must include the small shadow that was there at the time when the sun reached the meridian of the sky. Because when the sun reached the midpoint of the sky, the shadow stopped decreasing and there was a small, maybe a centimetre or two centimetres worth of shadow. So excluding that, when the shadow becomes the same size as the object, whatever size length the object is, that's when now the time for Dhuhr, uh, the time for Dhuhr has finished. The author he says, وَوَقْتُ الْعَصْرِ وَهِيَ الْوُسْطَى And the time for Salat al-Asr and it is known as the Wusta. Wusta, we'll explain in a minute what it means. So the time of Asr and it is known as the Wusta. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, حَافِدُوا عَلَى الصَّلَوَاتِ وَصَلَاتِ الْوُسْطَى وَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ Preserve the prayers, all of the prayers, preserve them. Especially the Wusta prayer. And stand for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in obedience. So some of the scholars, they said that the Wusta prayer, meaning the Asr prayer, it refers to the best prayer of the day. And others, they said it has the meaning of being the middle prayer in the day. Because it's middle of the two prayers, which is Fajr and Dhuhr, and then comes after Asr, Maghrib and Isha. So it either means the best prayer or it means the uh, middle prayer. So the author, he says, the time of Asr, and it is the Wusta prayers, من آخر وقت الظهر إلى أن تصفر الشمس is from the last time of ظهر and the last time of ظهر as we mentioned is when the shadow of an object becomes its same length until the sun becomes weak and yellow in color. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said in the hadith in Sahih Muslim ووقت العصر ما لم تصفر الشمس and the time of asr will continue as long as the sun doesn't تصفر تصفر it becomes weak and yellowish in its rays and in its color shining on the earth. Uh, some of the scholars, such as Sheikh Sulaiman Al Majid, he mentioned that this is basically when the sun starts to descend uh, for its descent to sunset, okay, in the evening. So the Asr time, according to our author and those who agree with his opinion, they said the Asr will continue from the end time of Dhuhr until the sun becomes yellow and weak in color. And as I mentioned, some of the scholars, they said that this is the time when the sun starts to descend on its descent towards Maghrib, towards the, the evening sunset. Um, the mashhur opinion, mashhur meaning the most popular opinion in the madhab amongst the Hanbali scholars, is not what our author mentioned. Rather, it's that the end time of Asr is when the shadow of the object becomes twice its size when the shadow of an object becomes twice its size. They gave preference to this opinion based upon the hadith of Ahmad, collected by Imam Ahmad and Abi Dawood, wherein the Prophet ﷺ was describing how he prayed with Jibreel Islam, and he said, ثُمَّ صَلَّ الْعَصْرِ حِينَ صَارَ ذِلَّ حِينَ صَارَ ذِلُّ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ مِثْلَيْهِ That uh, Jibreel ﷺ, he prayed Asr when 
the shadow of an object became twice its size. This is the time when the Prophet said, when this is the time. Uh, this is the time when Jibreel alayhi salam prayed the, the end time of Asr, meaning that this was the last time that you could pray Asr in. So this was just an extra point uh, for those who are a bit more advanced and they want that extra information, inshallah. And also they, with this opinion, the second opinion that I'm mentioning, uh, amongst the Hanbali scholars, they took the rule of Ihtiyat. They took the rule of Ihtiyat and they chose the shorter of the two times. Ihtiyat meaning that um, there's care and concern and being careful with regards to the act of worship. So they chose the earlier time due to Ihtiyat. In any case, as I mentioned, our author, he said that the end time of Asr is until the sun, the end time of Asr is until the sun becomes weakened and yellowish in its color. The author, he says, Then, after this time that we've mentioned, when the sun becomes weakened and yellow and it's starting to descend, this is the time now when the waqt, when the time of ikhtiyar has gone. The time of ikhtiyar meaning that the chosen time wherein you should have prayed, you must have prayed the prayer, Salat al-Asr. And what is left, وَيَبْقَى وَقْتُ الدُّرُورَ إِلَى غُرُوبِ شَمْسِ What is left after that is the time of necessity. The time of necessity until the sun has set. So you'll find in our discussion of these timings with our author, may Allah have mercy upon him, with regards to Asr, and Salat al-Isha, as opposed to the other three prayers, these two, Asr and Isha, they have two timings. They have what is known as Waqtul Ikhtiyar, the chosen and the proper time, the preferred time, the chosen time, and the Waqt al durura and the time which is for necessity. So the prayer, Asr and Isha, they should be prayed in the Waqtul Ikhtiyar, in the chosen time. This is when you should pray the Salah. With regards to Asr, as we mentioned, it's before the sun becomes weak and yellowish. After this time, what is left is the waqt al durura the waqt for those who have necessity, those who have a valid excuse for not having prayed in the earlier time. Valid excuse is like the one, a woman, she was menstruating and her menstruation only stopped in the waqt al durura in the time of necessity, in the 20 minutes or so before the time is going to come to an end. Or for example, somebody overslept without intending to, or somebody who is in real difficulty, or like a doctor is performing an operation. Uh, these people, if they were to pray in the waqt al in the last 20 minutes of the salah, for example, they, their salah would be valid and they wouldn't be sinful. Whereas if you prayed in the waqt al in the time of necessity, Without a valid excuse, your prayer is going to be valid, but you're going to be sinful for having delayed your salah. So with regards to Asr, Salat al-Asr and Salat al-Isha, nobody should delay their prayer until the waqt al durura You shouldn't delay your prayer until this time, which is known as the emergency time or the time of necessity, without a valid excuse, because you will then be sinful. The author, he moves on and he says, waqt al-Maghrib. The time for the Maghrib prayer The time for the Maghrib prayer is when the sun has set What they're referring to here when the sun has set Is when the, the, the Qars, when the disk of the sun Has completely disappeared from the horizon So when you look upon the horizon If you're at the beach for example And you look out across the water You see the sun setting When the sun, its disk, none of its disk can be seen that's when the time of Maghrib has now started for you. Okay, the time of Maghrib has now started. Until it will continue, until the redness in the sky, which is there uh, from the time of sunset until the time of Isha, disappears. So when the redness in the sky completely disappears, and of course you can't see that if you're living in cities like most of us are, but if you're out on the beach, if you're having a picnic in the countryside one day, uh, if you observe the sunset, you will see that after the sunset, there will be a redness in the sky. And when this redness disappears, uh, maybe an hour or so after the sun has set, that's when the time of Maghrib now comes to an end. Of course, these timings di differ from season to season, and they differ from uh, time zone to time zone, continent to continent. Dorothy says, 
May Allah have mercy upon him. وَوَقْتُ الْإِشَاء And the time for Isha مِنْ ذَلِكَ إِلَى نِصْفِ اللَّيْنِ The time for Isha is from that time, that time referring back to the end time of Maghrib, which was when the redness in the sky, the Shafiq al-Ahmar, had disappeared. It's from that time, إِلَى نِصْفِ اللَّيْنِ Until half of the night has passed. Until half of the night has passed. So how does one calculate half of the night having passed? What you do, you take the time of Maghrib, from the beginning of Maghrib until Fajr, you divide it in half, and that will be the time of Maghrib having started. Okay? Uh, sorry, that will be the time of uh, Salat al Isha having ended, meaning half of the night having passed. So the author he said, Wa waqtul Isha, the time of Isha was from the end time of Maghrib, min dalika ila nisf al layl, until half of the night had passed. And as we said, the way you would uh, calculate half of the night having passed is you would look from the time of Maghrib till Fajr and you would divide that in half and that would give you the half of the night, meaning the end time of the end time of Isha. Again, the mashhur opinion in the Madhab amongst the Hanbali scholars, the more popular opinion amongst the Hanbali scholars is that it extends not till the half of the night, it extends it till the third of the night. The third of the night, according to the more popular opinion amongst the Hanbali scholars, is that the waqtul ikhtiyar is until one third of the night has gone. Uh, and our author, he said, the waqtul ikhtiyar, the chosen time, is until half of the night has gone. He says after that, وَيَبْقَى وَقْتُ الدُّرُورَ إِلَى طُلُوءِ الْفَجْرَ الثَّانِي And the وَقْتُ الدُّرُورَ, again, the, the, the timing of necessity will remain until the, the, the second fajr has risen. Until the time of the second fajr. I'll explain what this means. So again, the author is saying that the time of necessity, wherein only those who have an excuse, a valid excuse, are allowed to pray in. And of course, nobody should want to pray in these times. Nobody should uh, try to delay this Salah to these times. It's only if there was a necessity. So in the time, the time of necessity for Isha will go from half of the night all the way up until the second Fajr. Okay? This is the time of Durura. If a person prays in that time with a valid excuse, then the prayer is going to be valid. However, if they did not have a valid excuse, the prayer will be valid, but they will be sinful. So the author, the author he said, until Tulu al Fajr thani, until the second Fajr, and meaning the second dawn. So the ulama they mentioned that there's two types of Fajr. You have Fajr al Kavib, which is the false Fajr, the lying Fajr, and the Fajr al Sadiq, the truthful, the real Fajr. So what you find is that before the sunrise, before the Fajr time, if you are out in the desert, you will find that maybe, just as an example, maybe 40 minutes before the Fajr time, you will find that the light in the horizon appears. And this light in the horizon, it doesn't appear across the horizon, it appears going upwards. So it appears going upwards and then after some time it disappears. So that's why they call it the false Fajr, the lying Fajr. It, it, it looked though as though it was going to be Fajr, but it's not Fajr because that light didn't go across the horizon. It went upwards and it disappeared. And the true Fajr is the light which comes from the horizon and it, it goes across the horizon and it starts to increase every time we get closer to the sunrise. So the author is referring to that the end time for the Isha, for those in the necessity time, is when the true Fajr, the true dawn, comes about. طيب. The author he says, وَوَقْتُ الْفَجْرِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ إِلَى طُلُعِ الشَّمْسِ And the time from Fajr is from that true dawn until the sun has risen. The وَقْتُ of Fajr, وَقْتُ of Fajr, Salatul Fajr is from that time when the true dawn, as we described it, until the sun has risen. The majority of the scholars, they're of the opinion that the Fajr Salah should be prayed whilst it's still dark, meaning uh, at the time of Fajr, but whilst there is still darkness, not like some of the ulama, may have mercy upon them, the Hanafi scholars for example, they have chosen based upon a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which they interpreted in a certain way, they chose to pray Fajr when there is some light in the sky and not when it remains dark. So the, our author and the Hanbali scholars who agree with him, they based it upon the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Bukhari wa Aisha radiyallahu anha, our mother, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she mentions 
She said, Kunna nisal mu'minat yashadna ma'a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-fajr mutallafi'at bi marutihinna that the, the um, believing women at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they used to pray with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam salat al-fajr mutallafi'at bi marutihinna and they would be wrapped fully in their clothing in their sheets. ثُمَّ يَنْقَلِبْنَا هِنَا يَقْدِينَ أَصَلَاءَ and then they would leave back to their houses. Hina yaqtina al ila buyutihinna la ya'rifuhunna ahadun min al Nobody would recognize them due to the darkness that was outside. Meaning that they couldn't really be distinguished. One, due to their wrapping up in the sheets. And number two, due to the fact that there was still darkness. So it's known that the Prophet wasallam, even though he would pray a long prayer for Salat al-Fajr, at the end of his prayer of Fajr, it would still be dark. This is why our ulama, our scholars, uh, they took this opinion that the Salat al-Fajr should be prayed while it's still darkness uh, after the time of Fajr. The author, he says, وَمَنْ كَبَّرِ الصَّلَاةِ وَمَنْ كَبَّرَ لِصَلَاةِ قَبْلَ خُرُوجِ وَقْتِهَا فَقَدْ أَدْرَكَهَا The author now, he's going to talk about, he's mentioning that a person who was, who has an excuse and didn't intend to delay the prayer, this person comes to the end time of prayer. There's very little time left for this person to pray. However, the person manages to get the first takbir before the time has finished. So the person manages to get the first takbir for Asr, for example, uh, just, just a minute before the time of Maghrib has come in. So this person, by virtue of the fact that he or she got the first takbir, the takbir al ihram within that minute before the time of Asr had finished, before the time of Maghrib came in, they would then... Uh, legally have their prayer valid okay as long as they didn't intend to delay the prayer there's nothing upon them why because the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim narrated by Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said إِذَا أَدْرَكَ أَحْدُكُمْ سَجْدَةً مِّن صَلَاةِ الْعَصْرِ فَلْيُتِمَّ صَلَاتَهُ وَإِذَا أَدْرَكَ أَحْدُكُمْ سَجْدَةً مِّن صَلَاةِ الْصُبْحِ مِّن صَلَاةِ الْفَجْرِ فَلْيُتِمَّ صَلَاتَهُ مِن قَبْلِ أَن تَطْلَعَ الشَّمْسُ فَلْيُتِمَّ صَلَاتَهُ Repeat the hadith again. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا أَدْرَكَ أَحَدُكُمْ سَجْدَةً مِّن صَلَاةِ الْعَصْرِ قَبْلَ أَن تَغْرُبُ الشَّمْسِ فَلْيُتِمَّ صَلَاتَهُ وَإِذَا أَدْرَكَ أَحَدُكُمْ سَجْدَةً مِّن صَلَاةِ الْصُبْحِ قَبْلَ أَن تَطْلَعَ الشَّمْسِ فَلْيُتِمَّ صَلَاتَهُ The Prophet ﷺ said in this hadith in Bukhari and Muslim that if one of you manages, manages to make a sajda, to make a sujood from the asr prayer before the sun has set, then let him continue with his prayer, meaning that his prayer is valid because he managed to get one prostration before the time had finished. Likewise, if one of you manages to get a prostration from the morning prayer, from the Fajr prayer, before the sun has risen, then let him continue with his prayer. Why? Because he managed to get a prostration, a sajda, before the time of Fajr had finished. So the ulama, they take from this hadith that this person managed to get one pillar which was the sajda, the sujood, before the time had finished. Therefore, the rest of his salah is going to be valid. So they said that there's no difference between the takbir, the opening takbir, which is a pillar, and the sajda, the prostration, which is also a pillar. So in terms, in terms of ruling, they are the same. So the Prophet ﷺ is mentioning that if somebody gets the prostration before the time has finished, then his prayer is going to be valid, he should continue. Likewise, the ulama said, from qiyas, from analogy, that likewise, if a person gets the first rukan, which is the takbirat al-ihram, the opening takbir, within the time, then the prayer is still going to be valid and they should continue with the prayer. And also they said, that the prayer, it doesn't, uh, its parts are considered as one. So if you get one part within the time, it's considered that you have the rest of the prayer within the time. The author, he says, وَالصَّلَاةُ فِي أَوَّلِ الْوَقْتِ أَفْضَلُ And the prayer in the first time, in the early times, is better. Whatever prayer you are praying in the early times, it's better. Why? Because this is how the Prophet ﷺ would do it. The Prophet ﷺ would always pray in the early times, except for the exceptions that we're going to mention. The Prophet ﷺ would pray in the early times. And Allah جل, he says in the Qur'an and other places, وَسَارِئُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ The encouragement Allah gives us in the Qur'an, and race forward. Don't walk, don't step, 
Don't take your time. Allah says in the Quran, وَسَارِئُوا Raise forward to the forgiveness of your Lord, meaning to the pleasure of your Lord, to the Jannah of your Lord, to the forgiveness of your sins. So we shouldn't procrastinate when it comes to good deeds. When it comes to doing the acts which Allah has obligated upon us, and then any other acts that we want to do to gain the pleasure of Allah, the mercy of Allah, we should do them as soon as we can, because our nature is to procrastinate. Shaitan, he's always there whispering upon us, saying, leave it, do it later, you have time. And then what we find happens is that the time gets tighter and tighter. We just about pray, we rush it, or we just about give that sadaqah, or, you know, the worst case scenario, we end up missing the prayer, or we end up missing that sadaqah opportunity, or that opportunity to, to read some Quran or do some good, because we procrastinated. So prayer in the early time is always better because you will have more relaxation. You will give yourself more time to enjoy that prayer, and to worship Allah in a better way. And the things that you left for the prayer, when you go back to them, they will have more blessing in them. They will have ease in them because you left them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you go back to them, Allah will give you blessings in them. Not like those who choose to finish what they're doing. And then when there's only a little bit of the time left, then they go ahead and they pray. This is not how it should be. Of course, there will be some situations in life when you have no choice but to do that. But you should be from a person that strives to pray in the early time and you are convinced of the bounties of Allah Azawajal, that whatever you left for the prayer when you go back to it then Allah Azawajal will bless it for you and it was better for you to leave whatever you left for the sake of Allah Azawajal's pleasure as we know in the other hadith the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said minhu. that whoever leaves anything for the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala then Allah Azawajal will replace it with that which is better so it's always imperative for us to put at our forefront of our minds and our souls and our hearts that whatever we do for Allah is better for us. And it will always, it will always feed back into blessings in our lives. Anyway, the author, he said, as an exception from the rule that I'm mentioning, which is that we should pray early, he says, Illa except for the last Isha. Why is he saying the last Isha? Because there are two Ishas technically. Uh, Maghrib is also called Isha, the evening prayer. The last of the Isha's is the Isha that we know, the, the one that we pray as the last prayer of the day, normally before we go to sleep. The Prophet وسلم, the author is saying here that it's better to delay this prayer, Salatul Isha, if possible. Why? Because in the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet وسلم, كان يستحب أن يؤخر الإشاء إلى ثلث الليل أو شطره أو شطر الليل that the Prophet ﷺ used to prefer to delay the Isha prayer until the last third of the night or until half of the night. So the Prophet ﷺ, he would like to delay the prayer. He would look at the state of the people in the masjid, if they had energy, if they were still awake and they weren't suffering, they weren't falling asleep, then the Prophet ﷺ would delay the prayer as much as possible. وَفِي شِدَّةِ الْحَرْفِ الظُّهَرِ And also another time when the prayer is recommended to be delayed, is when it's extremely hot in the day prayer of Dhuhr. When it's extremely hot in the day prayer of Dhuhr, again from that hadith from Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu in Bukhari al Muslim, the Prophet said, إِذَا اشْتَدَّ الْحَرْ فَأَبْرِدُ عَنِ الصَّلَاةِ فَإِنَّ شِدَّةِ الْحَرْ مِنْ فَيْهِ جَحَنَّمْ If the heat becomes severe, then stay away from the prayer until it becomes cool, because very, verily the heat of the day, of that time of the day, midday, is from uh, is from the fires of Jahannam, it's from the fires of the hellfire. So this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ in Bukhari and Muslim is recommending that when it's extremely hot for the Dhuhr prayer, that we should delay it until it cools down. Uh, Imam Ibn Rajab, rahmatullah alayhi, in his explanation of this hadith in his Sahih al-Bukhari Fatul Bari, <coughs> he mentioned that this delaying is for anybody, wherever they are, whether they're praying in the masjid, or whether they're praying in their house, including the women, etc. So it applies to anybody wherever you are when, the, when it's extremely hot, okay, you're allowed to delay the prayer until it cools down. But of course, it doesn't mean that you apply this sunnah in place of an obligation if you are a man. Meaning to say that if you know that the prayer is going to be established in the masjid, still, even though it's extremely hot, then you shouldn't leave off attending the masjid if you are from those who are fulfill the conditions of having to attend the prayer in the masjid then you should attend the masjid prayer and not and leave off this sunnah so you don't do a sunnah in place of an obligation 
okay? And for everybody else, they can uh, delay the prayer until it becomes cool. However, some scholars, they say in today's times, when there's ACs everywhere, maybe this is not applicable. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So that was a second exception from when you can delay the prayer. Tayyib. Um, but as we said time and time again, that the prayer times, they shouldn't be delayed because this is something that is disliked to Allah Azawajal. And in fact, if a person delays the prayer without due cause, without due reason, without a valid excuse in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the person is going to be sinful. And it's actually from the habits of the munafiqeen. It's from the habits of those who are hypocrites. That what they do is they observe the times. They're very lazy with regards to the time. They look at their watches. They know that it's time for them to pray, but they just take it easy. They carry on watching the football match. They carry on doing an extra bit of their essay or whatever they're doing. And when there's only a very little bit of time left, the hadith says that they go ahead and they peck the earth like the rooster pecks the earth meaning that their prayer is not valid they're just headbutting the floor very quickly they're not enjoying, enjoying the salah they're just up and down doing movements which are of no real benefit to them but the believer when the believer prays he wants to get to the masjid or he wants to get to the prayer place wherever that is in the house or wherever in early time why because he or she wants to sit there pray some sunnah make some dhikr read a page of quran get themselves prepared to do the obligatory prayer because they know that this is now their special time this is their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is going to be the place where they can have their du'as answered which is going to the, be the place where they can have barakah given to them in the rest of their lives which is going to be the place which is going to strengthen their faith so that they can go through the trials of life and they, they can make it easier on their path towards Jannah because as we know that the prayer is from the most foundational pillars of the religion and the more one spends learning about it the more one spends practicing it the better it will be for them um, the next condition i'm going to delay and i apologize for that um, i hope you forgive me we're going to come back next week inshallah by allah's permission and we will stick to the timings of the class which is supposed to be an hour it will be a lot longer as for today i'm going to stop here inshallah i'll take your questions if you have any questions for about 10 to 15 minutes uh, if I can help with those questions and then after that we'll call it a day inshallah until next week I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward us immensely for any good that we have done and any mistakes that I made to forgive me for them anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a gift and I ask Allah subhanahu to make this heavy in a scale of good deeds Ameen wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam